Hey y'all, welcome. Happy Monday. Good to see you. Let's see, knock the music down. Come on, come on. That's it. This song's a jam though. I'll tell you that much. Okay. Looking good. I think what is up? Welcome, welcome. Hope you guys are having a fantastic Monday. Looking forward to getting going here. I am teaching a lesson on hermeneutics tomorrow. And so I was thinking we should just jump into that, right? I've got a five views on hermeneutics book that I've read. And we can just kind of jump in basic hermeneutical ideas, all that good stuff. That's the plan. Just got some ice water going this evening. No tea for me. Have I had any tea today? I don't think I had any tea all day. Man, it's no wonder I'm not firing on all cylinders. Come on. Got to get my tea. But it is what it is. Here we are. And I think to start, I just want to talk about history of hermeneutics, maybe define some terms, and talk about the various approaches to hermeneutics that are taken. And I do want to talk about the hermeneutical spiral. And I think that's an important idea. Basically, if I walk through the book and I go to all my highlights, I'm probably going to get all of the key concepts that need to be discussed. So let's start off with that. The first chapter is on grammatical historical method defended by Craig Blomberg. And uh, he basically says, look, grammatical historical method is where you start. He says, it's not that the other methods don't have their place but you got to start with grammatical historical. And so this leads a little bit to the original audience being a original author, which is often all authorial intent. Hey, what is up? One digital church. Good to see you. Welcome. Welcome. How are you doing? Hope you're having a good Monday. So authorial intent comes into play, but not only that, here's also where he begins speaking about the, just what he talks about here, that the original audience understanding is normative. Unless contemporary interpreters consciously remind themselves they're reading documents from different cultures, they're going to mess up. Fuller meaning, census plenier. And that's honestly where you get the redemptive historical view coming into play. Fuller meaning. So that's the idea there. Authorial reader's response, intended audience's interpretation. People understand difference between good and bad history, time, place, genre, etc. I after I do after I do each of the approaches, I do want to talk about just general hermeneutical co concepts and ideas to help people out. And I'm gonna get these from mostly a grammatical historical perspective. One of them is genre. I need to talk about it. What's up, Ping? Good to see you. Welcome, welcome. Let's continue. Tradition criticism. The text speaks for itself, its own origin, all this type of stuff. I do want to talk about critical and that this has often led to unbelieving concerns or interpretations. So you can see when he's talking about form, source, redaction, criticism. Ping says, those books that were recommended last week about Jude seem kind of culty looking at them, so I haven't done anything with them. Who recommended them? Which ones were they? Oh, 
All righty. Historical criticism, rubric of inerrancy. But he does affirm critical in a way. So that's going to be important to talk about. What's up, One Shot? Been a minute. How are you? One Shot just went into two different streams and got banned in both. I just asked a question. Well, obviously you asked an incendiary question. Who would just ban you for asking a simple question unless you were intending to start fires with it? That's exactly it. Ping says, I don't know, someone in chat, it was something about heavenly being or whatever, both by the same person, reversing Herman and another by the same guy. Oh, uh, no, that's uh, that's Mike Heiser, Ping. Mike Heiser, he used to work for Lagos. Yeah, I'm a big Mike Heiser fan, just so you know. <laughs> Seem kind of culty. That's so funny. <laughs> I love it. Uh, <laughs> this is so funny. <laughs> he seems culty. <laughs> I'll show you who he is. Mike Kaiser. Oh, man. Have you watched the little video I did on biblical explanation for Greek and Norse gods? It's the exact same guy. Look, now, now you're about to know who Mike Kaiser is. <laughs> Ping is very sensitive to cults. <laughs> very sensitive. <laughs> we, we love you, Ping. I'm not, I'm not being critical. Hopefully this isn't too loud. Welcome to How We Got the New Testament. I'm Dr. Mike Heiser of Logos Bible Software. I'll be your professor for this course. This is him. Just a little bit about me. I have a PhD in Hebrew and Semitic languages from the University of Wisconsin at Madison. I also have a degree in ancient history from the University of Pennsylvania. I taught before coming to Logos for about 12 years, and this is one of the courses that I've taught a number of times. I think you'll find it interesting. In terms of the course itself, we're going to overview how we got the New Testament, all the way from ideas about inspiration on through the creation of New Testament books and then the copying and transmission of the text of the Greek New Testament. And then finally, we'll say some things about textual criticism and translation. So let's get started. There you go. That's him. Yeah, CalMagic, uh, Ping. I don't know if you remember CalMagic, but we recommended... Uh... We recommended Ping to look at Mike Heiser's work last week, and he came in and he said, it seems kind of culty. <laughs> that made me happy. So anyway, we had to introduce Ping to Mike Heiser so he didn't think he was a cult leader. So good to see you, CalMagic. How you doing? All right. Let's see. Ping says... When the first review on Amazon is a timeline diagram, my cult alarm goes off. I didn't see that video. That's so awesome. PhD in Hebrew and Semitic languages. So he's nerdy for nerds. That's correct. That's why he's so good, Ping. <laughs> All right. Okay, Cal Magic. No, no, not Cal Magic. One shot. One shot has been banned in two streams. Can we ban him in a third? Let's see. What does he say? One shot says. Sometimes when you talk to people, do you accidentally start talking in a similar accent to them? I think it's funny to me because it's totally unintentional. <laughs> That's not ban worthy. One shot. You were visiting some very snowflakey streams. Okay. You're good. That's not ban worthy at all. Good to see you. <laughs> hope you're doing well, man. How's things? How's things? I hope you're doing well. Pink says, the first review on Amazon mentions Yahweh and Yeshua. My cult alarm goes off whenever someone mentions those. <laughs> Guys, Ping, Ping has got it on lockdown, okay? Ping has got cult alarms all over the place. Mention, mention Yahweh or Yeshua. You can't just say God. Uh, you might be a cult member. Um, you know, if you... What, what were some of the other ones, Ping? <laughs> 
timeline diagram you might be a cult member <laughs> i love it ping nobody can say you're not a good watchdog i'll tell you that much uh anybody who would say that is wrong okay wrong what is up violent the five months is that what that says Shh. five consecutive streams this month watch streak thank you violent much love appreciate you appreciate you can i say adonai that's kind of sketchy cal magic 50 50. no it's fine if you mention god's name and such just not the first impression <laughs> not as the first message to me <laughs> you guys are the best anyway before we were scaring ping we uh we were looking at hermeneutics let's keep rolling through we're on the grammatical critical grammatical historical method of hermeneutics okay uh, provisional summary comparisons does not treat the document from an ahistorical perspective seeking merely to understand literary elements of plot theme motifs characterization narrative times and the like okay he's got some key ideas differing from postmodern approaches Our method differs from philosophical and theological approaches. It stops short of making syntheses that characterize the systematic theology. I would disagree with this. I don't think I don't think I've ever seen a grammatical historical interpreter do this, but I digress. Airhorn butt. Meh, meh, what? Meh, meh, meh. What? One shot Arsenal just resubbed for three months. Yes, Cal Magic, what is up? Much love to you. Much love to you. Cal Magic gifted to one shot. That's awesome. Thank you so much, Cal Magic. Appreciate you. One shot, I think that means you get a different teacup. I think you get a different teacup after three months. Sweet. Very nice. Yeah, look at that. I mean, you got to be drinking some, uh, that's rock tea. Got to be rock tea right there. Oh, one shot wants some prayer. Guys, let's pray. How did you mess up? All right, guys. One shot coming in. Turning it into the confessional. Guys, I now wish I had a button over here that I could change the scene and it would it would look like a confessional instead. Wouldn't that be cool? And then we would say, one shot. Tell me your sins, my son. One shot, I don't mean to make light. I don't mean to make light. I don't. We all mess up. And I'm glad you're willing to admit it. Now, if it is, messes it up, you don't have to say it. All right? All right? Well, you share as much as you'd like, but we would love to pray for you. Pink says, still a little sus of W-E-B because it uses God's names instead of Lord and such. Just tons of cults worry more about God's name than salvation. I feel you, Ping. I feel you, Ping. All right, guys, let's pause the music. Confessional time is not a time for quasars by Harris Heller. What do you got? What do you got for us? Here, we'll go to this one. Boom. All right. What do you got for us? One shot. Tell us. Tell us. We will pray for you. We will pray for you. Anybody else, prayer requests. Get them in the chat. Get those prayer requests in the chat. And we will pray. Master Amaris. Oh, man. See some macro hermeneutics on screen. Love to see it. What's up, Amaris? Good to see you. Much love, much love. Oh, one shot. Been drug free for over eight years. In the last two years, messed up. Did meth again yesterday. I feel like I'm going to die. Oof. One shot. I am sorry to hear that. That is not great. That is not great. Okay. Ping has got a prayer request for dad's friend recovering from a treatment. Look, one shot. Here's what I would say. There's a, there's a passage that always encourages me on this, and it's in... Scared, I disappoint my family. I understand one shot. There's a passage that I really appreciate on this, and it's in Ezekiel. Okay? We'll go look at this Ezekiel passage together, then we'll pray. All right? Very encouraged by this Ezekiel passage. So let's check this out. Here we go. 
This is a theme throughout Ezekiel. Here it is in Ezekiel chapter 3. Okay. Listen to what it says. If I say to the wicked, you shall surely die, and you give him no warning, nor speak to warn the wicked from his wicked way in order to save his life, that wicked person shall die for his iniquity, but his blood I will require at your hand. But if you warn the wicked, and he does not turn from his wickedness or from his wicked way, he shall die for his iniquity, but you will have delivered your soul. If a righteous person turns from his righteousness and commits injustice, and I lay a stumbling block before him, he shall die. Because you have not warned him, he shall die for his sin, and his righteous deeds that he has done shall not be remembered. But his blood I will require at your hand. But if you warn the righteous person not to sin, and he does not sin, he shall surely live, because he took a warning, and you will have delivered your soul. Okay? Um, it's a little further. This is about him being a watchman. But there's also, here it is. Yes, Ezekiel 33. Excuse me, here we are. Listen to this. This is very encouraging, one shot. You got to listen. Though I say to the righteous that he shall surely live, yet if he trusts in his righteousness and does injustice, none of his righteous deeds shall be remembered. But it, in his injustice that he has done, he shall die. Again, though I say to the wicked, you shall surely die. Yet if he turns from his sin and does, does what is just and right. Listen, this is you one shot. I say to the wicked, you shall surely die. That's how you feel. You feel the guilt of the Lord upon you, right? And you feel, I will surely die, right? Yet if he turns from his sin and does what is just and right, if the wicked restores the pledge, gives back what he has taken by robbery, walks in the statutes of life, not doing injustice, he shall surely live, he shall not die. None of the sins that he has committed shall be remembered against him. He has done what is just and right, he shall surely live. That is the encouragement we have. Now, in the New Testament, we know why this can happen, right? Seems wrong that God can sweep sins under the rug. Well, he doesn't sweep it under the rug. In the New Testament, we realize that the reason this works is because of the blood of Jesus. And so, when you become wicked by committing some sort of wickedness, some sort of sin, falling short, and you feel the guilt of God, you shall surely die. Bible teaches, repent. Repent of these sins. Believe, trust in Jesus. And restore your pledge. Give back what you've taken in robbery. Walk in the statutes of life. Don't do this anymore. Turn back from this meth from here on out, not doing injustice. Then you shall surely live. You shall not die. None of the sins that you have committed shall be remembered against him. You've done what is just and right, and you shall surely live. That's what you need to do. One shot. So it's good you feel guilty. It's good. But you need to lean into the guilt, not as a way to pour condemnation on your own head, but instead as a way to trust in Jesus. All right. Appreciate you bringing this up. This is not easy, right? This is challenging stuff, but I'm glad you shared it because in reality, there's so many people out there who are struggling with sin in their lives and they don't know what to do. And so repent of your sins, put your faith in Jesus, turn back, turn back from your wickedness and turn to do righteousness and walk in the statutes of life and you shall surely live. Let's go ahead and pray, guys. Father God, we thank you for your grace and mercy. We thank you for this opportunity to come together as a community here. Yes, even on the internet. We ask, Lord, that you bless our studies, bless our time together, draw us closer to you, help us to glorify and honor you with our lives. I want to pray right now for Ping, their friend's dad recovering from a treatment, no immune system right now. Lord God, we ask that he would not get sick, that you would heal him, and that he would get better and his immune system would recover. We also want to pray for Ping's mom's heart's issues. Um, there might be issues there. Um, if, it's, uh, if her heart is messed up or things like that, Lord, Pray that you'd heal her and help her. And also if she has ongoing sin in her life um, and ping, ongoing sin in ping's life, um, please help them to overcome these things and to transcend them and walk in your statutes, your righteousness, and please guide and direct their steps. I want to pray for one shot right now. One shot feeling very convicted, um, was able to stay clean for a very long time, Lord God. But don't let them just throw in the towel and say, ah, wow, I can't believe I failed. I'll, how will I ever put together a streak as long as this one? Um, maybe I should just give up. No, Lord, please help that not to be the case. Please help their hearts to follow you and to renew their commitment to walk in your will and your ways each day, anew and afresh. We ask for your grace and mercy. Um, and we want to pray right now. One shot is fearing they're going to have a heart attack. 
Um, we ask that that would not be the case, um, but that you'd preserve their life and teach them to walk in your will and your ways and be able to repent of their sins and follow you, Lord. So please guide and direct their steps, Lord. Thank you for all of your grace, and please be with us now as we study. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. That's right, Ping. That's right. Focus on God. Love to see it. Appreciate you all. Thank you for being vulnerable. It's not easy. It's not easy to be vulnerable, but it's important. Okay? That's how we help each other. Amen. Amen. Good. Good. All right. Let's get back into some macro hermeneutics. As Amaris put it, we're just walking through grammatical historical method and note noting some key ideas. Okay. And here's where he's talking, differing from postmodern, differing from philosophical. Oh, from this one is redemptive historical. Ping says, so Tanner, how do we defend from people saying the Bible talks about losing your salvation from the lack of faith? Do you have a specific verse? Are, are you referring to like the Hebrews, the verses in, in the book of Hebrews? So he's basically saying his perspective isn't right, but it's logically prior. More important. Cal Magic, five consecutive streams. Yes, watch streak. Not specifically Hebrews. I guess more, what does the Bible say about eternal security versus losing salvation? Well, you know, I'm, I'm convinced that um, it's more on the eternal security side. Oh, what's up, Derek? Derek Bollard. Wow, been a while since I have been on a PT live stream. Well, good to see you. Welcome. Thanks for swinging by. Derek says, one shot. Thanks for sharing your concerns. Takes a step of courage to confess sins. This is a good first step. I agree with everything PT said. I would also add that I would seek accountability. Yes, that would be very helpful. It'd be very helpful. Thank you, Derek. Appreciate you. How are you doing? I hope you're doing well. So, Ping, I am I fall on the side of, I, I believe that the Bible teaches, you know, eternal security once you are part of God's family, part of his people. He secures you and keeps you until the end. But I don't think that is without our participation, if that makes sense. Sanctification is a work with God and man, right? We often talk about salvation, soteriology, as a work that God does in our lives. Absolutely true. But sanctification, I think, is something that is that we participate in and so we have to agree and participate in our sanctification now my feeling is that a true christian because the holy spirit is doing work in their hearts and lives a true christian is going to feel guilty about their sins and gonna hate it hate their sins right so if you have an unbeliever they're perfectly content to sin no problems they feel fine and comfortable with it maybe justify it etc but a christian does not feel good about their sins. They are feel guilty about their sins whenever they sin. Um, they don't want to live in that way or that lifestyle. And so I think for the unbeliever, well, I think for the believer, God draws them back to himself through the conviction of the Holy Spirit. And I think that's part of how you know that the Holy Spirit dwells within you because God keeps convicting you of your sin and drawing you back to him. And so I think that's often how it works with eternal security. It's not that oh, I'm just saved and there's no problems. It's that if a true Christian falls into sin, God will not let them persist in that sinful state. There is a passage in Romans, I believe it is, and right here. Oh, no, I am getting it from uh, Hebrews. It is Hebrews. It's not Romans. 
My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. The Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. I think if you're truly a child of God, you are going to receive discipline and chastisement from God. And that is going to result in you turning away from your sins and continuing to follow God. So this is a very important passage for me when it comes to eternal security. One shot says, I got this way by being complacent with my relationship with God. I could see it happening slowly four years ago. I think that that it's great that Christians will pray for you and the unbeliever just ban you from their chat. Oh, uh, I got you. Yeah, well, one shot, keep leaning in, get some accountability, get some help. Like you said, that complacency, that leaks in if you're not careful. Careful, And um, having other brothers and sisters to walk alongside you and support you and help you is really helpful. Ping says, I was told recently the Bible has no support for not being able to lose our salvation. Oh, I, I disagree with that. Um, I always go to John 6, but I don't know if John 6 explicitly talks about eternal security. We'll go there in a second. CalMagic says, I think Ping's question needs to be demonstrated by true following Christ, not simply with the sinner's prayer, arise, O God, modified my view. Yes, exactly. Exactly right, CalMagic. It's more, it's more of a... Um, salvation is more than just a sinner's prayer. Yes. And I think you have to... Oh, I got you, Ping. I know someone who would say that verse doesn't cover lack of faith causing someone to lose their salvation. I see. I kind of know where to look. Figured it was easier to ask. Well, let me go to John 6. But I don't think... But I don't think it talks explicitly about eternal security. Maybe, though. Yeah, I mean, this one isn't as strong, but John 6, 54. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. I will raise him up the last day. Notice the link between eternal life and being raised up on the last day. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, I in him. Whoever feeds on me, he also will live because of me. In John 6, like whenever Jesus is talking about salvation, it's always basically assumed that whoever is saved, they, they get raised up on the last day. They survive until the end, right? Whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. Okay, so he's saying if you're abiding with him, feeding on the bread of Christ, you're going to live forever. But there are some of you who do not believe, for Jesus knew from the beginning those who were not, who did not believe and who it was who would betray him. He said, this is why I told you no one can come to me unless it is granted to him by the Father. So, John 6 is often where I go. Um, there are proof texts for these things. Let me, um, can I think of any other off the top of my head? It's so funny. There was one period in my walk where I was so ravenous about Calvinist doctrine that I had like all the verses memorized and everything. Just not the case these days. I, I just don't, I'm just not as concerned as much with these things. But um, I know like if there was a book I used to have in print, I don't know if I have it in Logos. I don't. It, this one though, five books of Cal, um, five, five points of Calvinism in light of Scripture. I mean, surely you're going to get some Scripture references here. Perseverance of the Saints. None of these are super compelling to me. Philippians three, John seventeen. Again, this phrase "eternal life," "eternal life," that is somewhat of an encouragement. John 6, 39. Yeah, that, that's a pretty big verse right there. John 6, 39. This is the will of him who sent me that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. This tying together with the raising up of the last day and losing nothing, that, that's, a pretty, that's a pretty powerful phrase, I think. 
Let's see John Tan. Again, eternal life, never perish. No one can pluck them out of my hand. Yeah. Attaining the glory. This is Ephesians 1. Yeah, so there you go. Handful of verses here. You know who's really good on this is uh, Robert Raymond. What's up, Praxis? Good to see you. I like Robert Raymond's systematic theology. I don't know why you're clapping. I'm talking about oh, you. Oh, come on. Get some Paul Washers. Thank you for that follow. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Let's see. I know the Bible talks about falling away, but that seems like more the people who weren't believers to begin with. I think so, Ping. And what's always been helpful for me on this subject is trying to have an understanding or a recognition of false belief, false conversion, right? So if you go to Matthew 7, Matthew 7 really frames up all my understanding of like these discussions surrounding whether or not you can lose your salvation, right? So Matthew 7... air horn but oh come meh, on meh. let's go Praxis thank you 412 Magic. just resubbed for one month yeah that's right that's right ping one can taste of the goodness of god uh without being saved yes and that's the hebrews language right they've once tasted of the heavenly gift and been part made partakers of you know the holy spirit all that type of language it's preliminary kinds of language right that's at least what it seems like to me Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear good fr bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown in the fire. Thus you will recognize them by their fruits. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. This to me is a description of false conversion. And once you understand false conversion, then many of the scriptures that talk about losing your faith or losing salvation to me are actually descriptions of... Your life of, is not oh, come on. in your hands. Your life is in the hands of God. Let's go. Masterwood just resubbed for two months. Thank you. Appreciate that, Master. Appreciate that. Thank you for the prime sub. Yes, much love to you. Much love. So once you understand false conversion is a thing, then to me, the idea that the Bible talks about people who can fall this away is bothersome. This is the biggest bothersome. room of what? freaked out you snowflakes you've ever seen in your life. Violent mm. Midget 300 cheered. X100. Yes. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Much love. All right, let me catch up over here. Let's see, Praxis, I haven't come across a verse where it says one can lose their salvation. I know it mentions that we will receive rewards based upon the works of the Spirit. Yes, 1 Corinthians 1. Pastor, what's good? Not much. Hope you're doing well, Praxis. Good to see you. Thank you for swinging by. All right, who else do we have? Human beings aren't bearing the fruit. God does, and we get to participate, right? Yes, that's when Jesus says um, that we must be united to him. Good. Yeah. No, I think that's good. So those are verses I typically go to. I like Robert Raymond's systematic theology on the topic as well. I think he does a good job. But, um, yeah, I used to get in all sorts of internet fights about this, and these days it's not really important to me. You know what's funny? I, uh, I'm known in YouTube spheres as a Calvinist. And so I uh, I was actually doing some collabs with another YouTuber, YouTuber. And once their audience caught wind that they were working with a Calvinist, um, let's just say those, those uh, collabs dried up pretty quick. So, hey, it is what it is. The, the funny thing is I don't care that much about it these days. Um, but there you go. Some people do. So Ping says, I once... I heard once that if we could lose our salvation, there wouldn't be the ability for us to regain our salvation again, kind of like a one chance 
sort of deal. I don't know how they supported it, though. Yeah, I don't know either. Praxis, the Church of Laodicea is a good example. It talks about them being lukewarm and spit out. Fake conversion, exactly. Once you understand the difference between true and false conversion, I think that helps a lot. Hello, Pastor Powers. What is up? Thoughts on James 5, 19 to 20. Whoever turns a sinner from the error of their way will save them from death and cover a multitude of sins. Let's check it out. Let's check it out. James 5, 19 to 20. And I'm, I'm guessing, Powers, you're bringing this up in light of our eternal security discussion. My brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. Yeah, uh, great verses. Um, I, I'm not sure this is what you're implying, but um, what you may be implying, Powers, is that, you know, if somebody, if somebody is doing this, right, and causing somebody who has strayed to turn back, then, and it saves them from a multitude of, covers a multitude of sins, then presumably if that individual didn't come along and stop them, then they could have fallen away permanently. And I just don't know that that's ne uh, necessitated by the verse itself, right? So... One of the things that I often talk about when it comes... Hey, let me just go over here. One of the things I often talk about when it comes to this topic is the question of means. What are the means through which God keeps secure his people? And I think the means God uses are often the Bible verses themselves that threaten that, hey, if you turn away, you are going to be lost, right? Those verses themselves... A true believer will read those and they're going to feel convicted and they're going to want to turn away from their sins, right? And even this one here, my brothers, if any among you wanders away from the truth and, and someone brings him back, let him know whoever brings a sinner back from his wandering saves his soul from death and covers a multitude of sins. I think that this is a means that God uses to save some of his people is through a brother coming along and helping them. And so that to me doesn't take away from the brother who helps them nor their motive, but the fact that God introduced a brother to help them is something that God does in order to preserve them, and this individual receives a reward. They saved their soul from death and covered a multitude of sins. That's not a fiction, right? They've saved their soul from death, and they've covered a multitude of sins. Just because God used that believer as a means to save their soul from death doesn't mean, oh, they would have been lost. Right? Like, no, the means God used to save them is this brother. And so, too, I just, I think that, I think oftentimes we forget about the concept of means and how God uses people or uses his word to preserve people's souls, if that makes sense. So, anyway, that's my take. If you believe differently, I'm not mad at you. I'm not mad at you. That's fine. That's fine. Amaris with the dab. Let's go. Boom been a while since I dabbed. Huh. Huh. Power says, great thoughts. Teaching on it tomorrow night makes sense. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Good question. Um, and so talk about means. That, that's what I do. I think that's helpful. And even I think that's true in the case of the passage in, in Hebrews. The passages in Hebrews warn, hey, if you don't turn back from your sin, you're going to be lost. They're, they're not a fiction. That's true. If you don't turn back from your sin, you are going to be lost. But will God's people not turn back from their sin? I don't think so. I think the Holy Spirit convicts them, and the word is used to cause them to turn back from their sin, right? Cool. Yeah, no, glad that was helpful. One Shot says, didn't know that salvation is something I can't mess up until like 2014. Man, I remembered smiling for two weeks during that time. What an eye-opener. Everything in this world depends on you to do. Whatever you do, there will be consequences, good or bad. But God in the garden was trying to show Adam and Eve not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Tree of life is what we want to eat from. Mm. Yeah, good thoughts. Good thoughts. Cool. Well, thank you, guys. All right. Back on the hermeneutics train. And now he has application. Each of them had to interpret Matthew 2, 7 to 15. 
And I do want to talk about that. Matthew 2, 7 to 15. And their exegesis. And let's see. So, we are not going to have anything like a comprehensive application of our method, but here's some ideas. Talks about the textual variants. Talks about the dating. So I don't know if I should put this here or down here. Let's put this down here as some ideas. Textual variants. Dating. Probably author is important. Ping says, also, small side comment. In Esther 10, does Esther have 10 chapters? Do you know if we have any remaining records of said chronicles mentioned in that chapter? I It's been so long since I read Esther. What are you doing reading Esther, man? You crazy. Crazy, no doubt. 10 chapters in Esther. Ah, it's very short. Just three verses. King Ahasuerus imposed tax on the land and on the coastlands of the sea and all the acts of power and might. Full account of high honor to Mordecai, to which the king advanced him. Are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Media and Persia? Mordecai the Jew was second in rank to King Ahasuerus and was great among the Jews, popular with the multitude. So let's go Esther 10.2 in the passage guide. And then let's hit up all of our historical commentaries. I know, how dare I read the Bible? <laughs> hey, man, you're getting after it points. That's all I'm saying. Good for you. Good for you. Now, let's see. We're looking for a historical context commentary. Right here, something like this. This closing formula is identical to that used in First and Second Kings and is undoubtedly intended to give this narrative a sense of continuity with the chronicles of Israelite history. On the Persian Annals, see comment on 223. Book of Annals of the King. All ancient Near Eastern monarchs kept records of events that occurred during their reigns. The Old Testament frequently me mentions the chronicles of the kings of Israel and Judah as a source of underlying the biblical narratives. In Ezra 4.15, we read the Persian king Artaxerxes was urged to search his annals for records of Persia's dealings with Judah. Herodotus writes that Xerxes even kept such records on the battlefield. He would position himself so he could watch the progress of the battle and his scribes recorded the names and deeds of any captains who performed valiantly. Okay. Keep going. Not too helpful. And again, we're just looking for something. I'm sure any in-depth commentary will have it, but we're looking more for like historical background, Bible background commentaries, those sorts of things, right? Ooh, handbook. Text of Esther. Summarization of story. Where's 10-2? Theology, we don't want that. We want historicity or something like that. Nothing. There's no chapter on which Esther appears. There are, however, two chapters in which Mordecai appears. Only Esther, sorry. Okay, we're going to find answers, y'all. I'm not afraid. Especially with a jam like this, how can we not find answers? Ooh, the Wiley. I haven't referenced Wiley in a bit. Will it talk, though, in depth? 
The Wiley talks about how things have been interpreted in church history. So this would actually be helpful if they cite it. Greatness of Mordecai, Focus of Mordecai. No, no. Okay, let's see. We are going to find. Some historical background here. I just got a new study Bible that is meant to. Oh, but it might be a church history study Bible. I think it shipped today, guys. ESV church history study Bible. Ahasuerus's power was the fading glory of this world. He is gone as records have perished. Mordecai had the interests of Jehovah at heart, despite the peculiar circumstances in which he was placed. His faithfulness will be remembered forever. So let's keep looking here. Recorded in the annals of the kings of Media and Persia, presumably the same annals mentioned in 6.1. This imitates the summary statements of the Book of Kings, lending a pseudo-historical tone to the story and official authority to the recounting of it. Shepherd's notes on Esther. No, I want... Again, I want something with a little more historical background. Looks more devotional. Our Persian chronicler tells us the other acts of Ahasuerus are recorded in another book of chronicles of the king of Media and Persia. It is possible he was gently letting the reader know, we're not going to have to spend time on this here. Whoever it was who wrote this book, we have seen that he cuts right to the chase. Leaving out years here and months there, he only records what he considers necessary. Apparently, Ahasuerus did not do much that made the cut in the eyes of the chronicler. Maybe because there was nothing truly noteworthy. While it is true that the entire first chapter of Esther is devoted to Ahasuerus, do not overlook the content of the chapter, Ahasuerus' party. The historian might have known his audience was being given a fairly revealing picture of Ahasuerus from the beginning. So, no, nothing we have referenced has mentioned the historicity of this document. That doesn't mean it's historical, it just seems to mean we don't have it, right? Biblical theology, study Bible. Erdman's Companion. No, we're not getting much here. The careers of Ahasuerus and Mordecai are summed up much like the kings of Israel and Judah. Though he was not in the line of David, Mordecai was a reminder that even under Persian domination, the hope of the coming king remained. I'm leaning towards we don't have it. Otherwise, I think one of these resources would have mentioned it. Let's see. Hmm. Not much here. Man, this song's a jam. What are we listening to? Harris Heller. Okay. I like the start of it. Masterwood says, that's a lot of commentaries. I am jealous. Well, doesn't mean I'm a good steward of them. 
10 minute bible hour podcast has been doing esther got you wow you need more commentaries man have you read half of those i haven't read five percent of them amaris commentaries are reference works everybody knows it what's up jack burr how are you god bless you i hope you're doing well good to see you welcome welcome Amaris, I try to read one good one a year, but probably use probably six to eight books for reference. Yep. Level one Tetris, Cal Magic. I love it. Not even a wiki page on this. Well, we'll look a little bit further, but we're I'm almost tapped out here. This is what I'm looking for. Something like this. These Bible background commentaries. Book of Annals of the Kings of Media and Persia. See comment on 223. So it sounds like he brings up these annals multiple times throughout the book. Royal annals were kept throughout the ancient Near East, with most examples coming from mid-2nd millennium Hittite kings and from 9th to 6th century Assyria and Babylon. The annals could be represented by annalistic royal inscriptions that give detailed accounts of military campaigns. In addition, there are court chronicles that give information on important events in each year. As of yet, no annals from Achaemenid Persia have been discovered. Boom. We got it. Thank you, Craig Keener. Nope, John Walton. Thank you, John Walton and crew. There you go. That's the answer. Found it in this little book. IBP, Bible background commentary, Old Testament, Walton, Matthews, and Cavallus. So there you go. They say, nope, we haven't found it. We haven't found any annals from this period. Nice. Weird we don't have any chronicles of them at all, though. Yeah, not wrong. Not wrong. But we found the answer. There we go. All right. Let's continue. And... We were summarizing some of the major themes. Background, historical background. Grammar. Grammar and translation. Okay, no problem, Ping. Thanks for hanging out. Take care, all right? Appreciate it. Yeah, not a problem. Not a problem. Cross Kaneo. Source and redaction critic pull stuff. And these are these are part of his grammatical historical approach. And I may or may not want to go into this source form and redaction criticism. It's more along the lines of like history of hermeneutics. I don't know that it's as relevant for like, you know, doing hermeneutics itself, if that makes sense. And this quote is strong. The historical, grammatical... Critical approach is by no means the only legitimate approach to the biblical text. However, it is the necessary foundation on which all other approaches must be built. It's a very strong statement. It might be true. Might be true. Interpretation of Matthew 2, 7 to 15. 
from Blomberg. And what's interesting is that he just, he doesn't give much of an interpretation. He just kind of talks about how each of the grammatical, critical, historical approaches apply, if that makes sense, like what they would have to say in that way. So very interesting. So you can see clearly we have a secure text. We can proceed to the tasks remaining before us. Commentators differ on dating. Various questions of his historical background typically surround a discussion of the Magi's visit. Near the end of his life, he became increasingly paranoid about real or imagined attempts on his life, would have been greatly threatened if he had believed that one legitimate in the line of Israel's king had been born. Magi most likely a cross between what we'd call astronomers and astrologers from Persia or Arabia. So he spends extensive time of the magi and the historical background surrounding Herod. Little treatment of Micah 5.2. Danger from Herod turns out to be real. Because they had to escape to Egypt, they would later have to return from Egypt. Oh. No, he does treat Hosea 5.11. So how does he treat it? He says, look, Matthew does typology here. So then I could get into redaction criticism, source criticism, all that type of stuff if I wanted to. CalMagic, are you going to spend a few minutes differentiating exegesis and hermeneutics? I know there's a lot of discussion on how they're both defined and implemented. Yes, CalMagic, we have to do that. So let's, let's do that now. I think that's a really good idea. And so let's go ahead and grab the fact book. And let's do exegesis. And you're 100% correct about this. We have to get some definition surrounding these ideas. Exegesis. An interpretive method that establishes the meaning of a biblical text or passage by studying its historical context and making application of that study to the contemporary situation and environment. Described as being derived from the Greek exagain, to lead out, this hermeneutical approach to biblical literature assumes an essential meaning within the text that can be isolated and exp explained through philological and historical methods that establish a literary contemporaneity 
between the community that produced the text and the reading community. And that's a good point, CalMagic, is how would they define hermeneutics then? Praxis says, I would say hermeneutics gives the tools and exegesis takes these to start the process of interpretation. Definitely going to put that down. It's funny because even in the biblical hermeneutics, five views books, he talks a little bit about definitions up front and exegesis itself. And even he doesn't like arrive at a major conclusion. Look, students and scholars alike struggle to differentiate between the meanings of terms like biblical exegesis, interpretation, and hermeneutics. This very tension in defining the concepts of biblical interpretation, human hermeneutics, and exegesis leads to one of the major questions influencing the debates in the book. Some scholars use interpretation and her hermeneutics interchangeably while others dif differentiate between exegesis, interpretation, and hermeneutics. And he quotes Westfall here. I know I have a book from Westfall, but do I have that one? Whose Community? I do not. Oh, I do. This one right here. So he says in this book that these definitions are broken down. Whose community, which interpretation, especially hermeneutics 101, pages 17 to 26. Interpretation or intuition. So this one little chapter, according to the editors, is a really good one to talk about this. We should probably read this chapter. Let's do this. It may seem obvious that Christians interpret the Bible. It is not, so exegesis and interpretation. Master Wood, that was a duck. No, that was a rabbit, Master Wood. Obviously a rabbit. Okay. Here's his eye. There's his ears. He's looking up at the sky. Duh. Duh. <laughs> it may seem obvious that Christians interpret the Bible. Is not every devotional reading silent, every sermon spoken, and every commentary written an interpretation or a series of interpretations on the biblical text? Does not the history of Christian thought show that Christians in different times and places have interpreted and thus understood the Bible differently? Even at any given time and place, such as our own, is there not always a conflict of interpretations between, among, and within various denominations and non-denominational traditions? So it seems obvious that Christians would be interested in hermeneutics, a the theory of interpretation that is sometimes normative, how we ought to go about interpreting, and sometimes descriptive, what actually happens whenever we interpret. But often enough, the, her the hermeneutical theory, if we may call it that, of lay believers, pastors, and academic theologians consists simply in denying that interpretation is necessary and unavoidable. We encounter this general attitude when we offer a viewpoint about, say, some controversial moral or political question to someone who, one, doesn't like it, and two, doesn't know how to refute it, perhaps deep down knowing that it is all too much on target, and so replies, that's just your opinion. Similarly, an unwelcome interpretation of some biblical text may be greeted by the response, well, that might be your interpretation, but my Bible clearly says dot dot dot. In other words, you interpret, I just see what is plainly there. I am reminded of an ad for a new translation of the Bible. Build is so accurate and so clear the publishers could announce no interpretation needed. The ad promotes the revolutionary translation, which allows you to immediately understand exactly what the original writers meant. But of course, this immediacy is mediated by this particular translation, one among many, each of which interprets the original text a bit differently from the others. I already like Merrill Westfold. James K. A. Smith, A Fall of Interpretation, Philosophical Foundations for Creational Hermeneutics. Jamie Smith, the editor of the present series, first called this ad to my attention years ago at a conference on biblical hermeneutics. I have often had an occasion to recall it. That's pretty cool. I like James K. A. Smith. 
fall of interpretation. Oof. Okay, let me let me throw this up here real quick. Story to start. The ad promotes the revolutionary transit. Well, we already read that. This no interpretation needed doctrine, that interpretation is accidental and unfortunate, that it can and should be avoided whenever possible. Often unnoticed is that this theory is itself an interpretation of interpretation, and that it belongs to a longstanding philosophical tradition that stretches from certain strands in Plato's thought well into the 20th century. This tradition is called naive realism. In one of its forms, it is called naive both descriptively because it is easily taken by a common sense perspective without philosophical reflection and normatively because it's taken to be indefensible on careful philosophical reflection. Before looking into why this interpretation of interpretation might deserve to be called naive in the second sense, let us first try to be clear about what it asserts and why. Realism begins as the claim that the world, the real, is out there and is what is independent of whether or not we might think about it. By the way, I have a realist metaphysic myself, so I don't know if I'd call it a naive realism, but um, most most uh, Christians are metaphysically agnostic. Like, they, they, uh, they don't have a self-consciously developed metaphysic, um, and I think that's not great. And anyway, I'm a metaphysical realist. CalMagic says, every person reading the Bible interprets the Bible based upon their own worldview, biases, and experiences. Yes. Throw that in there, CalMagic. Just trying to think of where to put it. Probably right here towards the start. Realism begins as the claim that the world, the real, is out there and is what is independent of whether or not, and is what it is, independent of whether or not what we might think about it. But since, in spite of appearances, no one actually denies this, if realism is to be a claim worthy of defending or denying, it must say more, and it does, is the further claim that we can, at least sometimes, know reality just as it is, independent of our judgments about it. In other words, our thoughts or judgments about the world correspond to it, perfectly mirror it. It is because of Kant who affirms the first claim, denies the second claim, that he is the paradigmatic anti-realist. He insists that we don't know the thing in itself, the world as it truly is, but only the world as it appears to human, all to human understanding. We don't apprehend it directly, but only as mediated through forms and categories we bring with us to experience. In other words, the human mind is kind of a receiving apparatus, like black and white TV set, that conditions the way in which what is out there appears. Thus, the world as we see it is partly the result of the way the real gives itself to us as passive receptive and partly a result of the way we take it as active and spontaneous. Like the gestalt psychologist, Kant does not suggest that we are aware of our contributing role, that our taking is conscious and voluntary, much less deliberate. It happens, so to speak, behind our backs. I generally agree with what he's saying here, but I, I'm not sure that changes reality itself, right? Yes, Reality is mediated through our senses, for example, or our minds, but I feel like God created the world so that we're meant to apprehend it. And so let's pretend even realist metaphysic is wrong. Well, we still have to act as though it's right. You know what I mean? Like the world in which we live and as we perceive and understand it is real or not, we have to act as though it is. I don't see any other option, really. Incidentally, although scholars usually ignore this fact, Kant regularly identifies appearances, the way in the world, the thing in itself, the way God sees the world. Things really are the way the divine mind knows them to be. So theists, who have a good reason not to identify our finite creaturely understanding of reality with God's infinite creative knowledge, have a sound theological reason for being Kantian anti-realists. Our thoughts are not God's thoughts any more than our ways are God's ways. But again, if you want to functionally say God creates the universe or world in such a way that 
we're meant to interact with it and apprehend it, then I think that leans in the other direction, right, of being more realist in your approach. The only other option would be insanity, right, Masterwood? It would seem it would seem that that were the case. Naive realists, including the no interpretation needed school, who may never have heard of Kant or anti-realism, deny, at least implicitly, the inevitability of such mediation. They affirm a direct seeing that simply mirrors what is there, without in any way affecting what it is seen as it is seen. Plato expresses this view in connection with the philosopher's apprehension of the forms, the purely intelligible structures that are the highest, indeed the only objects of genuine knowledge when he speaks of contemplating things by themselves with the soul by itself. In speaking of this direct unmediated rendezvous of subject and object, or of whatever sort, philosophers view the object as immediately given or immediately present. The claim to immediacy is the claim that the object is given to the subject without any mediating, contaminating, or distorting input from the subject, be it on the lens through which the object is seen, the perspective from which the object is seen, or the presupposition in terms of which the object is seen, all of which might vary from one observer to another, or from one community of observers to another. Yeah, I agree with all that, but I still don't think that affects realism. The problem is in me, not in the object itself. Common sense doesn't talk about immediacy, presence, or givenness, but it does claim to just see its objects, free of bias, prejudice, and presuppositions, at least sometimes. We call this just seeing intuition. Oh, so what he's saying is, He's trying to build the case that most people are not consciously aware of their biases, and so therefore they have a naive realism. They believe they're perceiving the object as it actually is without any interpretive lens through which they're viewing it. But I don't think you have to deny realism to realize, oh, no, I have an interpretive lens myself. So I don't disagree necessarily with what he has said, but I was already thinking past it, I believe. When the naive realist view of knowledge and understanding is applied to reading texts, such as the Bible, it becomes the claim that we can just see what the text means, that intuition can and should be all we need. In other words, no interpretation needed. The object in this case, the meaning of the text, presents itself clearly and directly to my reading. To interpret would be to interject some subjective bias or prejudice or prejudgment into the process. Thus the response, well, that might be your interpretation, but my Bible clearly says... In other words, you interpret and thereby misunderstand, but I intuit seeing directly, clearly, and without distortion. I didn't. I don't know that he had to give like a a philosophical treatise on uh, why this is the case. I, he may be right, but anyway, he's a philosopher, right? So, renowned philosopher Merrill Westfall. Why seek to avoid interpretation? Let us turn to the question of motivation. Why would anyone want to hold the hermeneutical version of naive realism? Let us dismiss, but not too quickly, the suspicion that this view is attractive because it makes it so easy. I am, we are right, and all who disagree are wrong. Not merely wrong, but wrong because of bias or prejudice. There are more respectable reasons, two of which immediately come to the fore. The desire to preserve truth as correspondence and the desire to preserve objectivity, a closely related notion in our reading, preaching, and commentating. So far as truth is concerned, the hermeneutical question is not whether what the text says corresponds to or perfectly mirrors the real. It is rather what the reader, preacher, or commentator says corresponds to what the text says. This is especially important if we take the Bible to be the Word of God, that as such again and again becomes the Word of God for us as we read it for ourselves or pay attention to its exposition by the preacher or commentator. But if, according to the Kantian interpretation of interpretation, what we find in the text is a mixture of what is there, and the human all too human lens through which we read and by which the text is mediated to us is the voice we hear divine or merely human. The hermeneutics of immediacy is not the only way to preserve correspondence between what the text says and what we take it to say, but it is probably the simplest. This is actually really helpful because without even thinking about it, I bet I have people in my congregation who think they're not doing interpretation at all and might push back against the concept of hermeneutics from the start. So I'm glad this is here, causing me to reflect on it a bit. Cal Magic, my belief is that God is orderly as opposed to chaotic. Therefore, God is logical, so we study logic, which follows that he is a mathematician and we have found the universe to be, to, to be mathematical, reflecting God. So that to me is the only way to see reality. Yeah, I buy that, Cal Magic. And I think that's how you have to form worldviews. You have to take them as like big lenses or chunks and then view the world through them and see if it works, 
right? See how well it fits. See what the resonance is between the proposed worldview and the world itself. But that's a different epistemological framework than most Christians use. Closely related to the notion of truth as correspondence is the notion of objectivity. For the sake of truth as opposed to mere opinion, that's just your opinion, it may seem that the contingent and particular factors that make one knower or knowing community different from others should be filtered out as subjective and distorting. Since Plato, mathematics, which is highly immune to the subjective interpretation, has been a paradigm, if not the paradigm, for truth as objectivity. We should all get the same answer to the question, what is the square root of 16? If we ask, what are the contingent and particular factors that need to be filtered out, the a prioris, the lenses, the presuppositions, the receiving apparatuses that might contaminate our readings and produce misunderstanding, one of the most conspicuous candidates would be the traditions within which the Bible is read and expounded. The rich diversity of readings of the Bible that make up Christian history are not, for the most part, the result of individual idiosyncrasy, but of traditions that have developed and are passed on and shared by communities and generations. The Desert Fathers, the Geneva Calvinists, the American Slaves, today's Amish belong to different traditions of interpretation, as do the two sides of the debate within the Episcopal Church and others over the question of homosexuality. So this is actually really helpful because it's going to bring me to the hermeneutical spiral, which I need to talk about in the class. One shot. I love that Pastor Tanner is so calm and seems to not argue harshly with anyone who may believe differently than he does. That's not always been the case, one shot. I used to get very dogmatic about things. But as I've explored other perspectives and points of view, I've begun to realize that other people also have good reasons for what they believe. Not that I necessarily agree with them, but I can understand how they get there. So some think that's a virtue. As you are bringing that up, you say you love that I do that. Um, others think that is a vice. I've had some in my congregation not so happy with the fact that they think I'm a little soft on certain topics or subjects. So, Hello, how are you? Come here now. Good to see you. Welcome, welcome. Thanks for swinging by the channel. We're just uh, working through a little philosophical work on Bible interpretation. This is precisely a powerful motivation to privilege intuition over interpretation. For the latter seems linked to the notion or rather reality of different traditions, and if interpretation is relative to the tradition in which it occurs, the specter of relativism haunts us. In the meaning, if the meaning derived is a product of both the text and, th and the tradition with it, within which the text is read, we arrive at a familiar question. What happens to truth and the voice of God if every understanding of the Bible is relative to some human, all too human, tradition of interpretation? Once again, the appeal to intuition to just seeing what the Bible says is not the only way to attempt to avoid relativism, but it is quick and clean if it can be sustained. Can interpretation be avoided? No, now he's going to make the case that this is not possible for human beings to do. Right? And he's correct. Angie Jags! What is up? Good to see you. How are you? Welcome, welcome. Happy Monday. Angie, we are working through Merrill Westfall's Your life is first not chapter. in Come on. your hands. Your life is in the hands of 39 God. 39 months? Are you kidding me? Angie Jags 88 just resubbed for 39 months. 39? What? Much love to you, Angie Jags. Appreciate you. Hot fire. Yes. Hot fire. Much love. Appreciate all the love and support. Awesome. CalMagic says, PT would be more forceful when discussing views that matter to one's salvation. All other positions that aren't part of salvation is all good to discuss with no hard feelings. Good way to put it, CalMagic. I appreciate that. Praxis says, so in layman's terms, hermeneutics is analyzing the content and structure of biblical literature. It has rules, if you must. Always seek to know what the author's intended meaning was to the original audience, letting scripture interpret scripture, and several others. More importantly, knowing the different genres of biblical literature, history, wisdom, Prophetic, apocalyptic, gospels, epistles, etc. Praxis crushing it. Yes, there's a lot to like there. So much to like there. I'm going to copy that, and I might use it in my class tomorrow. Guys, I don't know if I told everyone. I'm teaching a class on this tomorrow, right? So that's why I'm preparing. Usually I do sermon preparation right now. But yeah, I'm teaching a class on this tomorrow, so I want to get it right. I liked everything you said, Praxis. And 
scripture interpret scripture is a key idea that needs to be brought up just generally speaking um i forget what this is called it's called like the uh there's a name for this thing scripture interprets scripture it's got like a fancy theological word that goes with it but yeah that's exactly it perfect So I'll probably start with definitions first, and then I will go into this stuff. Why is interpretation needed? And then the case is going to be made, it's impossible to avoid it. Just like CalMagic says, every person reads the Bible, interprets the Bible based on blah, 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 blah. I don't know if I want to talk about the Enlightenment or not. Maybe. That's a maybe. Indeed, brother. Yes. I have found there are even subgenres. War narrative. Yeah, genre is going to be something I explicitly talk about. Got it right here. Genre. Very helpful. I uh, I have long taught that if you don't interpret the Proverbs as Proverbs, but instead as promises, you'll be sorely disappointed in your Bible. But can the appeal to intuition be sustained? The case for just seeing is not easy to make, and the naive realism inherent in the no interpretation needed viewpoint may prove to be naive in the second pejorative sense given above. As we have just seen, however briefly, the whole idea that some construals are subjective interpretations while others are objective intuitions is itself a particular and contested tradition within philosophy. It is ironic that proponents of theologies that like to think of themselves as innocent of uncontaminated by philosophical prejudices or prejudgments or presuppositions so easily make themselves heirs of this tradition. It looks as if this hermeneutics, this interpretation of interpretation, is itself relative to the presuppositions of a particular philosophical tradition. To make matters worse, in a variety of normative areas, including ethics, politics, and theology, individuals and communities appeal to intuitions, to what we've been called just seeings, that are as divergent as the traditions from which they attempt to flee. There's a conflict of intuition just as much as there is a conflict of interpretation. This is helpful too. I am becoming a fan of Mr. Merrill Westfall. And it may be that the tradition is at work in the one case as much as it is in the other. Take racial bias as an example. If I have grown up in a racist community and have been effectively socialized into it, I will just see that people who belong to a particular racial or ethnic group are morally and intellectually inferior to me and my kind, possibly to the degree of being only semi-human. Quite possibly, I will just see that the Bible supports my view of the matter. My receiving apparatus has been so formed by a living and effective tradition that the people in question cannot appear to me otherwise, unless and until I am re-socialized out of this community of interpretation and into another. We too easily deceive ourselves on this point. What I just see is a construal that just sees its object with a pure immediacy of intuition may be an interpretation richly mediated by a tradition that is alive and well, both in my community and in my thinking. While it is easy to show... Well, this, this song is j jamming too hard. Look, I like it, but I don't know if it's like Merrill Westfall jams. You see what I mean? There we go. The idea of Proverbs being promises as a result of literalism from some other source. I really like that. Cal Magic, I'm going to copy that. Praxis, and then exegesis of the text is what occurs when you have an understanding of the literary context and begin to unpack the text using the hermeneutical rules. That's what I think of, praxis, yes. I think your hermeneutics, th these are the rules we've decided are the good rules to use, and then your exegesis is the individual particular application of those rules. That's how I take it. 
But I just want to finish this chapter from Merrill Westfall, and then I might have to uh, grab the definition out of the New Interpreter's uh, Dictionary of the Bible. While it's easy to show that we can be mistaken in a, taking a particular seeing to be a just seeing, it is harder, if not impossible, to show that no one ever has intuitions that are genuinely immediate. But perhaps the rush to immediacy can be slowed down and by anticipation, the general fear of relativity somewhat assuaged if we look at some models where the plurality of viewpoints is not a compromise of truth and objectivity. Consider the following figure. I think the question is going to be um, what's, what face is in front and what face is in the back? Okay, I think that's what he's going to ask. So if you look at CDGH as the face in the front, then the square moves backwards, right? Or you could interpret it as ABEF is the face in the front, and then it's it moves down and behind, right? We are told it is the schema of a box with five cardboard sides and an open top. Whenever I draw this figure, I see ABDC as the open top. Yes? This construal comes so naturally that it seems immediate, and experientially speaking, I just see it that way. But then I remember that there's another way to see it. Take some time and some work, but eventually I see ABFE as the open top. Ah, then he's looking down on it like this. ABFE as the open top. In the first case, I'm slightly to the right of the box and I can see its right-hand side from the outset, but not the left-hand side. In the second case, I'm slightly to the left of the box and I can see the left-hand side from the outside, but not the right-hand side. But neither of these things is right in the way that makes the other wrong. Note that even though there are two correct answers to the question, where is the open top, it does not mean that every answer is correct. A, C, G, E, C, D, H, G, E, F, H, G, B, D, H, F could all be seen as open sides, but not as an open top. This is already helpful too. All right. Now, where's my man Masterwood? Masterwood, consider the famous duck rabbit that Vic Wittgenstein borrows from Jastro. If I see the critter as looking to the left, I see it as a duck. But if I see it as looking slightly up and to the right, I see it as a rabbit. Here again, neither seeing is the right one, but of course it would be wrong to say the figure is a moose or a spider. <laughs> that is one ugly rabbit with a long neck. <laughs> I love it. I love it. That's correct, Master Wood. The two figures are sufficiently indeterminate to accommodate anything, accommodate more than one thing is correct without permitting the anything goes relativism that is conjured up as a bogeyman at the first hint that human understanding might be relative to human conditions. The questions that arise in is whether certain kinds of texts, including biblical texts, are like this. Then he brings up a poem. Do I want to do a poem? Another possibility is suggested by this poem. There were six men of Hindustan, to learning much inclined, who went to see an elephant, though all of them were blind. Oh, this is the whole approach that um, they all... So I haven't seen it as a poem before, but I've heard the story of a uh, bunch of you know bunch of indians go and they feel an elephant they're all blind one is grabbing on the tail he says this animal's like a rope another is putting his arms on the side no this animal is like a wall another has the trunk in his hand um no this animal is and you get the idea here the multiplicity of interpretation stems not from the indeterminacy of the object but from the way it exceeds the ability of any limited perspective to grasp it in its totality 
Each man's perspective or tradition enables him to grasp an aspect of the elephant that all others failed to grasp. So each was partly in the right, as a perspective without which the truth about the elephant could not be told. But all were in the wrong because they took their partial grasp for the whole. Hence the quarrel, which might easily have turned violent if the elephant were considered sacred. Is it precisely the inability of human understanding to grasp reality in its totality that led Kant to downgrade human understanding in comparison with the divine? Here the hermeneutical question arises, whether some texts, including the biblical texts, are like the elephant, rich enough to require not merely to permit a multitude of different readings just because human readings are always partial and perspectival, and because no single reading is able to capture and express the overflow of meaning these texts contain. We think this way about Shakespeare. Why not think this way about the Bible? Once again, the possibility of necessary multiplicity does not open the door to just anything. None of the six blind men had warrant to say the elephant was like a keyboard or a file cabinet. So I'm just looking to see... Yeah, that, that was a good one. I'm glad I referenced that. The gold and the blue dress. Ah, that's a good that's a good modern example, Masterwood. That's right. Did that one go around on Instagram? Is that the one that was on? There was somebody that had pointed out that there was a dress and they called it blue and somebody else said it was gold and, you know. The original ra rabbit duck illusion is much better in its original form. There's another one that I think is better, young girl slash old lady. I need one that's easy to draw, though, Cal Magic. It was all over. Yeah, I remember that one now. I think I remember coming home from work and my wife was like, is this dress blue or gold? And I was like, what is, what kind of question is that? Why do you ask that question? Cool. This is good stuff. All right, let's keep rolling. I think I've got enough to functionally describe the difference between hermeneutics and exegesis. Now I want to move on to the next one. The literary postmodern view. Okay. This one's going to catch a lot of heat, I think. And I, I know a lot of Christians love to hate on postmodernism, but I would encourage you to look at Peter Lightart's intro to his little book, Solomon Among the Most Postmoderns. Right here. Solomon Among the Postmoderns. You don't even have to read the whole book. Just look at the introduction. I hope to show APCs, anti-postmodern Christians, that postmodernity is, in the sense that sociologists generally use the term, simply a fact. It's simply a fact. Whether we want to call it postmodernity or something else, whatever we still share with the modernities of the past few centuries, we need some term to describe the remarkable set of interrelated cultural and political changes. We need some historical balance here. Though we are always living in times of transition, sometimes are more transitional than others. We seem to be in one of those times. To resist postmodernity without qualification is like resisting the end of the second millennium. It's too late now, and it was going to happen anyway. Pro-postmodern Christians encourage other Christians to shed their old-fashioned commitments to truth and the so-yesterday binary opposition of right and wrong and get in step with the spirit of the times. Increasingly, I have wanted not only to clarify what postmodernity is and what postmodernists are trying to say, but also to bump some PPCs off of their bandwagon. So, anyway, I think this is helpful.
CalMagic says, check out the YouTube, the incredible ch color changing deck for how easily one can be fooled by their own mind. That sounds interesting. I'm going to put it in there for later. All between blue and red. Interesting. Cool. All right, let's go to two literary postmodern. Right here, Scott Spencer. Boom. Regarding the now familiar triad of author text or reader oriented approaches to biblical interpretation, current literary focus critics concentrate on the latter two options. I need to go pull up. So not only is there a hermeneutical spiral that I need to talk about. So we've got all this talked about this. But I also need to now talk about, so we've done definitions. Done definitions, we've got some pictures and examples. I think that'll be helpful. Then I need to talk about hermeneutical spiral. I've written all this stuff down elsewhere. I think maybe I thought I was gonna do them at the end, but I need to do them up front. Right here. And then the four foci of the discussion. So I need to go to page 201 in here because I noticed they have four foci of discussion. It really frames up the options when it comes to hermeneutics right here all of the hermeneutical approaches share four major foci of discussion around which their treatments take place the world's external to the biblical text the biblical text itself the authors of the text and its current readers okay so all four of these are really important And part of the reason I bring that up is Scott Spencer brings up three of the four in his. Author, text, reader. Right here. Author, text, reader. And then this is just historical background, his audience, if you will. CalMagic, there was an experiment that was done in the 1950s. A football game was filmed and when shown to the fans of each team they each saw something different depending on the school they attended college game the experiment had to be has been repeated several times different ways it is now accepted that people can observe an event and come up with differing conclusions that's fascinating cal magic also reminded i don't know if you've heard of the like of this one but they had a they have a team passing around a ball right and they tell you focus and count how many times the ball is passed right so you know there's maybe three or four players and they're passing around a ball over and over and you're, you're focusing and counting that and then in the background somebody walks by in a gorilla suit right they're wearing a big gorilla suit they like walk by pound their chest and leave and most people don't ever see it because they're so focused on the counting right and that's the idea of i think it was like called unconscious bias or something like that as well so yeah, there's a lot of stuff like that these days. We're learning a lot about the brain and how it works, and I think that's helpful.
the now familiar triad of author text are reoriented approaches. He says he focuses on the latter two, text and reader. But whatever we lack, we at least have in hand Matthew's text, more or less. So he's saying we don't really know the author. In their best practice forms, literary postmodern approaches cohere in giving prime attention to the text at the high point of the triangle, with readers especially. Texts do not read and interpret themselves, and authors providing vital base support. So you can see there's his approach. He's saying, hey, if, if we do the postmodern approach properly, we're not as worried about the original audience or the author, because we don't have that. Accordingly, literary-oriented approaches that respect the integrity and distinctive presentations of the first century gospel narratives are by no means anti-historical or unconcerned with ancient materials outside of the text. I don't know why you're clapping. I'm what? talking about you. Thank you for the follow. Much love. Appreciate you. Appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you. Xander. Much love. Okay. Readers, even within shared cultural and theological traditions, bring their own perspectives, experiences, and competencies to bear on the interpretive event. The reader factor pushes the notion of dialogue miles by beyond a simple two-way variant or the singular monologue to an intricate communication network. Polyophonous, multi-voiced, and heteroglot, other-tongued circuits. If this is true for more or less homogenous groups, how much more for a highly diversified biblical readership as increasingly confronts us in our global web-wired world? Two major strains of resistant New Testament reading have avowed feminist and post-colonial interests. With this stress on polyglot perspectives and power dynamics among texts and readers, we jump full square into the precarious world of the postmodern criticism, which staunchly resists absolutist claims about determinacy, universality, you, uh, it's univocal, but I can't say it when it's got I-T-Y on the end, Univ univocity and legitimacy in biblical interpretation. In this worldview, an open Bible does not merely allow for more multiple readings, it intrinsically demands them. Influenced by French literary theorist Jacques Derrida, the askew, rigid, dualistic, hierarchical, binary, oppositional, analytical categories pertaining to gender, ethnicity, government, class, and other socio-political relations. Where does all this openness lead us? Into hermeneutical anarchy. Where anything goes, it runs that risk. Yet nothing requires us to be postmodern deconstructive purists, pushing instability and indeterminacy to the brink. Common experience and seasoned exegetical practice confirm that meaningful communication happens despite propensities towards misunderstanding. So you can see he's trying to be a little more conservative about it. <laughs> Masterwood. Those pesky French. I like their fries, though. Fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> The Gorilla video and the color changing card were done by Richard Wiseman. YouTube channel Quirkology is a psychologist, magician, and a good friend. That's awesome, Cal Magic. Very cool. Small world. Yeah, I didn't even think of it, but you're like particularly equipped to tell us how the human mind gets easily fooled. In brief, amid the, all the panoply of readings of open an open Bible generates, there remains legitimate limits of interpretation constrained by the text itself and authorial intentions, however restricted our access to those might be. Kevin Van Hooser cites an extreme example from a literary critic, Umberto Eco, 
but one that effectively scores its point. As Echo poses, if Jack the Ripper told us that he did what he did on the grounds of his interpretation of the gospel according to St. Luke, I suspect that many reader-oriented critics would be inclined to think that he reads St. Luke in a pretty preposterous way. I certainly hope so. There is such a thing as misinterpretation, as Van Hooser concludes. I think that's a helpful quote because a lot of postmodernist readings tend to tend to kind of drive towards eh, anything goes right all right focal text matthew 2 7 to 15 so how does he interpret matthew brings up source critics redaction critics all this type of stuff We might ask what interpretive gain we derive from positing discrete Herod and Magi traditions behind our text. While the source critic interprets these as patchwork sutures, the narrative critic negotiates them as a creative tension. So... He says, these supposed inconsistencies in the text surround Herod further flesh out him as a character. And he says, while such a trek could be tracked on a map of ancient Near East, them going to Egypt and back, literary-oriented critics are more concerned with the symbolic relations among these places. Ironically, the holy Jewish city of Jerusalem represents the center of opposition to the true Jewish king, Jesus, who finds a welcome home in a small outlying village of Judea and Bethlehem in Galilee and Nazareth, and even in the non-Jewish east of Egypt, both notorious regions of bitter exile in Israel's history. This, this song's too much of a jam, too. Whoa. Calm down, Harris Heller. Calm down. How long have I been streaming? Nearly two hours. Regarding plot, we may further unpack the precarious journey motif that dramatically propels Matthew's story towards suspensional conflict and resolution. The hard time of it the Magi had on such a long journey to the Christ child through unique in many though unique bleh, though unique in many respects echoes the other excursions and pilgrimages. So this is helpful because he's kind of, they take the Bible as literature, right? They're not so concerned to establish the historical reliability of it, right?
and he's got his Egypt motif. Yeah, this is very interesting. Okay, I gotta stop here. He's got lots of interesting insights. Well, that approach isn't the worst. I like what Scott, Sp Scott Spencer brought up. Although one might take Blomberg's statement to be true. It's, it's not that he's arguing for the exclusivity of the grammatical critical historical. Instead, it might simply be that it has primacy, if that makes sense. Cool. All right, guys, I went almost two hours. Yeah, 153. And I think this is a good stopping point. At some point, maybe tonight, maybe tomorrow, I'm going to have to take the other three approaches and throw them in here. For those who don't know, we have uh, the redemptive historical approach, which I agree with on some fronts, but not other fronts. Um, Richard Gaffin is a professor at my alma mater. Um, so there you go. Um, but I don't agree with him uh, across the board. And then... Uh, the canonical approach is quite interesting. Um, is that this one? Yes. The canonical approach is actually similar to the postmodern literary approach. Excuse me. But instead of focusing on reader so much, it focuses on text and how the text has been received down through church history. So it has a little more that's tied to history itself, right? So I think there's power in that one. And then the last one, yeah, this one is this philosophical theological from Merrill Westfold. It can almost not be called an approach. Um, he essentially refuses to exegete the text in question, and what he ends up doing is just give some ideas or concepts to think about when it comes to hermeneutics, which is helpful. And then what I'll do after that is I will put together some things to think about when it comes to interpreting your Bible. And th these will probably be mostly derived from a grammatical historical approach. And that should be way more than two hours of content. So, Dunzo. Dunzo. All right, I appreciate you all very much. Thanks for hanging out. Praxis, thanks for the great session. Amen. Appreciate you, Praxis. Thanks for hanging out with us this evening. And I had a lot of fun. I uh, am looking forward to teaching on this topic tomorrow. And I appreciate everyone's interaction, discussions. thought it all went really well. Like I said, I have some work to do offline. But for the most part, I mean, you guys helped me really zero in on the key themes and ideas. Maybe I'll, do, I'll look into source critical, form critical, redaction critical definitions to share with people. But maybe not. Right. There, there can be a downside to presenting people with too much material. Right. Masterwood, hope your lesson goes well. Thank you. Me, too. And then, of course, I will be doing some sermon prep later this week for this upcoming Sunday's sermon when I will be teaching on the topic of joy. It's the pink candle. Y'all, if you celebrate Advent, 
You go purple, purple, pink, purple when it comes to candles. And it's uh, hope and peace, which I've already preached on. Joy coming up. And then after that, I forget the last one. Oh, it's love. Love is the last one. So anyway, looking forward to that as well. Um, But that's it for me tonight. Appreciate you all very much. Thanks for hanging out. And I hope you have a great evening, a great rest of your week. Going to be recording a vlog after this to upload to Patreon. If you're interested in supporting us on Patreon, exclamation mark Patreon. And you can see I do weekly vlogs over there. And then, of course, I'm pretty booked recently, but I try to record YouTube videos when I can. Guys, Jess's music is popping off lately. And so sometimes I got to support her and uh, help her to write her music. So anyway, we're doing what we can. Appreciate you all very much. Thanks for hanging out. And I will see you all again very soon. Take care. God bless. Bye.